Uh, you know, I started writing this thing, and, and um, I, I never wrote. I mean, I really used to write in the penitentiary. I used to write letters, right? And I used to write pretty well. But I never. But I never. Uh, you know, I've never written. I never wrote a story. I never. You know, none of that kind of stuff, right? But I decided that I was going to write my story, right? right? Anyway, so I started writing it, and then, you know, I, of course, I made him. So I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you. This is the. Uh, the introduction of, of my story, right? And uh, <clears throat> it begins like this. Out of the pit, Folsom State Prison, April 2nd, 1996. I had been in prison for the past three years, all the way it wouldn't be long before I was set free again. It was 7.55 a.m., but I'd been awake four hours, pacing in my cell, trying to make time move faster. Instead, it seemed to move in slow motion. It was always like this whenever I was about to be released. The tension would mount each day as the day grew near. The night would seem longer and it would get more difficult for me to sleep. My brain would suffer a persistent dull pain from all the questions that zipped through my mind, making my head hurt like the time Carlos Montes whacked me on my skull with a ball pin hammer back in 69. Every morning I would suffer unrelenting stomach ache that kept me on the toilet for long periods of time. Where would I live? How long would I stay out this time? Would I get a life sentence the next time I got busted? After all, the three strikes you're out law had taken effect in March of 94 in California. I had read the language of the statute in the prison library when it had first been implemented, and it clearly stated that anyone with two prior felony convictions who was arrested and found guilty of any type of felony would be sentenced to life. The state was serious, too. I had read a newspaper article about a guy from San Diego who had been sentenced tonight for stealing nothing more than a couple of slices of pizza. I had five prior felonies. I really didn't think I could stay out either. The last time I had been cut loose, I had been so nervous I had rushed to a liquor store and bought a half pint bottle of Smirnoff vodka and a pint of orange juice as a chaser to calm my jitters. Even though I hated alcohol, I had guzzled the entire contents of the bottle trying to relieve my anxiety. When the vodka hit my stomach, it had temporarily eased my fear, but it also tore down what little resistance I had about breaking the law. As soon as I reached my destination, I quickly located my homeboy Babo and got a free shot of heroin from him. I started stealing after two after my two two hundred dollar in use money ran out a few days later. I didn't want to drink alcohol or use heroin or steal anymore, but I didn't know how to live in the outside world. Sometimes I wanted to tell someone that I didn't know how I was going to survive on the streets without breaking the law. But there was no way I could tell any of my fellow prisoners I wanted to go straight or that I was terrified of being outside of the world without sounding weak. The very notion of being afraid of freedom seemed ridiculous after all. Getting out is what every prisoner dreams about. Suddenly, I heard the echo of the man's footsteps as he approached to cut me loose. Hola, que well, it's time for me to get going, I said to myself. And I hear you, homie. Come on, nigga, dude, we don't have all day, Officer Miller Park. Yeah, yeah, I thought. It was the same old game of hurry up and wait. Officer Miller stuck his big brass key into the lock and in one quick motion turned it to unlock the steel bar door. Everything was deathly quiet in the cell block, and I heard the door squeak as he swung it open. There was no one on the tier when I stepped out of my cell because the entire prison was on lockdown. An altercation between a Northern California Mexican and a Southern California Mexican violent prison rivals a few days before had led prison administration to confine all prisoners to their cells 24 hours a day. Walking toward the door, towards the stairwell at the end of the tier, I briefly stopped in front of my road dog, Beto Cell. Get me to take a shot for me, home squeeze, he said, smiling brightly as he shook my hand through the bars. Simone said, I replied as Miller and I continue on. A guard sitting behind the desk, situated inside the cage at the entrance of the cell block, hit a button and hit underneath the counter and unlocked the door leading to the main corridor. Officer Miller pulled the steel door open when he heard the loud buzzing sound and we stepped onto the main hallway, wide and tall enough to drive three 18-wheel trucks side by side through it. Normally, 
when walking down that corridor at any given time of the day, it was as packed as the, as the crowded state fair at peak hour. You could barely hear the guy standing next to you speak because of all the loud shatter created by many men talking and laughing at the same time. But now, Officer Miller and I were the lone two men and hearing the echo of our footsteps in that desolate, cavernous hallway made me feel like we were the last survivors in an abandoned underground nuclear bunker. It wasn't until Miller unlocked the door to receive it and release that I saw the other inmates who were being released as well. As soon as I walked into the room, I sensed the underlying nervous anticipation of everyone there. No one said anything, but it seemed as though we all knew we were about to embark on a difficult journey. An R&R &R guard stood behind one of those doors that opens the top half, turning the bottom closed door into a sort of counter. He handed me a large, brown bag containing the street clothes Mama had sent me two weeks earlier. Mama hadn't forgotten the kind of clothes I liked either. She had sent me a stone gray long sleeve shirt, a pair of black dress slacks, a black belt, mashy black socks, a boxer underwear, and a pair of gray on black Stacy Adams alligator skin shoes. Taking off my prison suit, I slipped on the clothes Mama had sent me and immediately felt that I was no longer a faceless member of the orange jumpsuit crowd. Afterward, I sat down on the long wooden bench bolted to the wall. I tried to sit still as I waited for Officer Miller to call my name so I could sign my walking papers. But my nerves were on edge. I felt sweat run down my armpits underneath my shirt and my stomach hurt too. I needed to take a shit. Unable to contain my apprehension, I strolled over to where the other prisoners were waiting to sign their release papers, and when my turn finally came, I walked up to the counter where Officer Miller stood. I grabbed the pen and waited to sign my name, my name on the forms he held in his hands. He was reading the paperwork slowly as if something was wrong. After a while, Officer Miller looked up over the rim of his glasses and slowly shook his head. I don't think you're going anywhere this morning, that I he scoffed. For a brief moment, I stood there in disbelief. Then a wave of pain moved through my stomach as if Officer Miller had stuck a knife in my gut and slides from one side of my body to the other. I tried to keep my facial expression blank, attempting to hide that he had gotten to me. But in that instant, my world came crumbling down. What kind of game was this clown playing? First he tells me I'm going, and then he says I'm not. What do you mean I'm not going anywhere? Well, did I lose Miller's smirk? These documents indicate you have an outstanding warrant. I wanted to shout no, but my mouth felt dry. I glared at him, thinking that he had to be playing some kind of wicked mind game with me. But the cruel look in his eyes and the contemptuous grinning face that on his face let me know he was dead serious and that he loved every second of going me. Just as I was about to lose my cool and snatch from behind the counter to beat the life out of him, he smiled at me and said, get laid and take a shot for me, home squeeze. Abruptly, I awoke, gasping for breath, in a cold sweat, disorientated, and realized I'd been dreaming. I shook my head and attempted to clear my thoughts and remembered that I was going to be released later that morning. And even though I should have been happy that I was finally getting out, I felt the knotted fist in the pit of my stomach. 